The first category of members of armed forces that are protected against attacks are the enemy or the combat. Article 41 of Additional Protocol 1 expressly provides for a prohibition to attack that category of persons. Those persons are defined in Article 41. According to that article, and I quote it, a person is hors de combat if he's in the power of an adverse party. He clearly expresses an intention to surrender, or he has been rendered unconscious, or is otherwise incapacitated by the wounds or sickness, and therefore is incapable of defending himself. Persons in the power of an adverse party include all those who are within the effective physical or territorial control of that party, for example, those who have surrendered. Persons or the combat also include wounded, sick or shipwrecked members of armed forces. Moreover, Article 42 of Additional Protocol 1 provides for a specific protection to any person parachuting from an aircraft in distress. Such persons are protected against attacks during their descent, even if they take a direction enabling them to join their own armed forces. Articles 41 and 40, 42 of Additional Protocol 1 are considered as reflecting customary AHL, applicable to both international and non-international armed conflict. In any case, the prohibition to attack persons or the combat in non-international armed conflicts may be drawn from the general protection provided by both Common Article 3 to the Geneva Conventions and Article 4 of Additional Protocol 2. In particular, the prohibition to commit any act, any act of violence, such as murder. This protection applies to all persons who do not take part to the hostilities, including, as expressly considered in the text, to those who have already taken up arms but have ceased to participate in combat for various reasons, including detention. The prohibition to attack some persons fallen into the category of enemy or the combat may also be inferred from the obligation to respect and protect those persons who include prisoners of war in international armed conflicts and all military wounded, sick and shipwrecked persons protected in both international and non-international armed conflicts. According to Article 41 of Additional Protocol 1, persons hors de combat lose their protection if they engage in any hostile act or attempt to escape. Similarly, wounded, sick and shipwrecked persons are protected on the basis that they refrain from any act of hostility, which includes, according to the RCRC commentary, any attempt to escape. However, HL treaties do not give any definition of the notion of hostile acts or act of hostility. According to the RCRC commentary of Article 41 of Additional Protocol 1, hostile acts include the destruction by surrendered troops of installations in their possessions, or their own military equipment, or any attempt to communicate with the party to the conflict to which they belong unless this concerns the wounded and sick who require assistance from this party's medical service. It is disputed whether the notion of hostile acts or act of hostility differs from the notion of direct participation in hostilities. However, as suggested by the examples given by the RCLC commentary, it seems much broader as it does not imply that participation be direct. As a result, persons hors de combat will lose their protection as such and will normally become targetable, since they are members of armed forces. But as we learn in Chapter 4, the protection afforded to wounded, sick and shipwrecked persons 
also apply to civilians in case such a civilians engage in hostile acts. This does not mean that they will become targetable. They will lose their protection as wounded, sick and shipwrecked persons and become targetable only if their hostile act amounts to a direct participation in hostilities.